you have just written a really, I think, important article in the cradle about how three BRICS countries, we're talking about Russia, China, and Iran, have been coordinating, navigating, dealing, and wheeling around what has transpired over the last several months, especially mm -hmm. Israel's incredibly dangerous aggression in Lebanon, in Iran, which has left uh, the entire collective West kind of holding its breath about what might happen. Could you talk about what exactly Russia and Iran in particular we can begin? And then, of course, uh, bring in China. But you had so much important information for people to understand and know about this burgeoning relationship and how it relates to what Israel is doing. And, and really, it, now, a lot of these recent moves are response to Israel. That's that's pretty massive and I think is not getting enough attention. So, Pepe, to you. Uh, I'm sure in the, well, in the US is not getting attention at all. All of us who follow American mainstream media, of course. Uh, first of all, because they don't understand the character of the interlocking strategic partnerships, Russia, China, Iran. They simply don't get it. And even the think tanks don't get it. Well, China, let's say, uh, oversimplifying, of course, China is more or less on the diplo uh, in in the let's say in the backyard in the diplomatic front. They are as explicitly saying that they uh, support Palestine. They explicitly acknowledge over the phone Wang Yi and the acting uh, Iranian. Uh, Foreign Minister Ali Bagadikani, excellent diplomat. They had a phone call a week ago, and basically Wang Yi said, look, whatever you decide in your response to what Israel did in terms of assassinate uh, Haniye in Tehran, you know, we got your back. This is enormous, and it's part of their strategic relationship, which is uh, energy, uh, it has military components as well, geopolitically, of course. The fact that uh, Iran wanted to bring uh, uh, Russia, China, sorry, wanted to bring Iran into BRICS for a long time, etc. Iran at the SCO, etc. So let's say this is a, a Chinese SCO angle of supporting whatever Iran does in West Asia. Russia is much more complex because. Their uh, strategic uh, partnership uh, militarily is very, very advanced. Basically, Shoigu went to Tehran uh, two, two weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken, basically to accelerate the signing of their uh, overall strategic partnership, including uh, military, ultra high level military exchanges. Of course, all those uh, uh, Antonov cargo. Uh, planes landing in Iran uh, a few days ago carrying a lot of stuff, including practically certain, of course, no smoking gun from either side because this is mega top secret. Certainly, the Murmansk BN uh, jamming uh, those 35 meter high towers capable of jamming everything anywhere uh, at a range of 5,000 kilometers. So the Russians certainly provide Iran with that. So in terms of uh, bolstering Iran's uh, aerial defenses, this is absolutely priceless. And uh, maybe some extra hypersonic uh, Mr. Sarmat and Mr. King Zhao kind of deal that we we don't know about, but quite possible. Consider that Iran, they have their own hypersonic missiles, but not as advanced as, as the Russian missiles. And of course, the fact that uh, Russia continues to buy the <laughs> tons, in, in fact, tens of thousands of uh, Shahid uh, drones from Iran. So Iran said, okay, uh, we're going to need this, 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 and this for our response. And the Russians said, oh, yeah, of course. Basically, what I heard last year in Moscow when an Iranian delegation was visiting Moscow, and they said, look, the dialogue was fantastic. Basically, we told the Russians, anything you want, just ask, and vice versa. And obviously, for the response, the way it, this is being organized between Khamenei, the IRGC, and other uh, focuses, nodes of the axis of resistance, they're going to need a Russian, Russian military help. 
Of course, this has to remain secret because Russia has a tremendous problem when it comes to Israel, focus it on the 1 million plus Russian passport holders or double passport holders who live in Israel. This is a very, very complicated affair because according to the Russian constitution, Russia has to protect them. The fact that many of these are hardcore Zionists and with a genocidal mentality makes the problem even more unsolvable. But Russia has to deal with that as well. So whatever, whichever way they choose to help Iran, it has to be extremely carefully calculated, as carefully calculated as the Iranian and acts of of resistance response to the assassination of Shukr in uh, Beirut and Hanye in Tehran. The Iranians are not in a hurry. I had this conversation these past few days. They are not in a hurry at all. They already said, look, we might not do anything if there is a plausible, serious ceasefire in Gaza. For the moment, it's not uh, credible. There is the possibility of a ceasefire that Hamas already said, no, we don't agree because Netanyahu, Netanyahu all the time is blocking uh, some sort of resolution. So this is the only conditions that Tehran said that, that they would not uh, retaliate. So they will retaliate. But it can be, uh, it won't be like we imagine. It would not be uh, in the first few days and weeks. And they could postpone it to September, or even to late September, or even to a few days before the BRICS summit. And, and anything is possible because the initiative is with Iran, and they choose what they're going to do, how they're going to respond, how deep, how complex, what they can, uh, what kind of installations they want to to target. So they have the initiative, and of course they have. This support in the back by Russia and China at different levels, geoeconomic, geopolitical, and diplomatic, is already assured. So this would be basically a BRICS SCO operation. For all practical purposes, Iran will be responding from the point of view of BRICS and SCO to a branch of the forever wars complex is in Israel. Uh, in uh, what they are doing uh, genocidically in Gaza. So this is very, very serious. This is a, a direct clash between <laughs> the title of my latest book, Eurasia Against NATO Stunt. This is a chapter of Eurasia Against NATO Stunt in practice, in front of us, in front of the whole world to see. You know, So this requires very careful preparation. It will happen, but it will happen on Iran's terms. And then, obviously, uh, Danny and all of you, all bets are off because then there will be the counter response by Israel and anything is possible, including a nuclear response. Kiev style. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I think those are the stakes, Pepe. And you know, it was so interesting. I, I, one of the reasons why your article is so critical is because it goes over the series of events so important. I mean, Sergei Shoigu was in Tehran very quickly. I mean, very yes. quickly to not only discuss uh, what might happen in terms of Iran's retaliation, but also to discuss military to military partnership, the military relations, mm -hmm. uh, sewing up bo on both sides. Uh, what kind of military armaments they're going to be uh, trading essentially with each other. And then, of course, you had this very important meeting, too, that you mentioned with Mr. Abbas, the uh, maybe yes. not so legitimate president of the Palestinian Authority. But nonetheless, you said hours long worth of conversation with Vladimir Putin himself. True. And this comes after the Beijing yeah. Declaration, which Russia also helped engineer with China. It was brokered in China, but the Beijing Declaration, both Russia and China have been working so hard with Palestinian leadership around how to develop this kind of new unity government. So talk about how these developments also fit into this larger, as you said, BRICS 
supported BRICS aligned support for uh, what Iran and, of course, the rest of the axis of resistance uh, may do from here and into the future? Well, the, the Chinese, uh, then, they took the assassination of, of Han Ye as a personal affront, as a, a diplomatic slap on their faces. You cannot do this in Asia and get away with it. All of us who have lived in Asia for decades, we know this on an everyday basis. You know, these are the basic rules of uh, of life and uh, interaction across Asia. You cannot have your interlocutor lose face in such a manner or basically insult him in front of the whole world. Only a few days after Han Ye was one of the representatives of 14 different Palestinian factions coming to Beijing, invited by the Chinese, signing the Beijing Declaration with Wang Yi putting the Chinese stamp of approval and support to the declaration, the Israelis killed the main negotiator of a ceasefire in Gaza. Well, I, 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 could, I could take <laughs> uh, days explaining to all of you uh, precedents in the Chinese diplomatic history uh, to what happens to people who try to pull, pull something of that caliber. And uh, if Genghis Khan or Genghis Khan's hairs were still active in Asia, the response would be a pyramid of schools in Israel, you know, at least. But okay, we're not there yet. But this was taken by the Chinese as a personal affront. So that's why they are even more implicated in diplomatic Chinese style, uh, supporting everything concerning Palestine, Palestinian unity, Palestinian efforts, and of course the Iranian response to what uh, what Israelis did with the assassination of Ani. And, of course, Ru Russia and China, they discussed this among them, and, of course, they discussed with the Iranian leadership as well. We can, um, of course, it's not uh, practically established, but those phone calls between Wang Yi and Lavrov, now they involve the acting Iranian foreign minister Ali Bagherika. Uh, they already appointed Agachi for as a new, uh, but but it was not confirmed by parliament yet. So for the moment, the top diplomat in Iran, a negotiator of very very serious stuff, is Bagherika, extremely competent. And I'm sure they are talking. Uh, he's talking to Lavrov and Wang Yi, you know, full time, absolutely full time. Just like uh, Lavrov and Wang Yi f talk full time about Southeast Asia, for instance. Uh, for instance, last late last month, they were here at the summit in uh, in Laos, uh, the East Asian summit, and they had a bilateral that lasted pr practically ha half a day discussing Southeast Asia. They discussed West Asia on pra practically on a daily basis as well. But the thing is how to calibrate this response to a point where they are not uh, the the counter response by Israel not only will bleed Iran, but could bleed Russia and China in several ways, you know, uh, further on down the road or immediately. So, so that, that's the complication. And we, we, we can more or less understand that from the point of view of this BRICS trio, a response by Iran before the BRICS summit would be essential. Because this will go to the BRICS summit and be presented to the other BRICS and to the, the countries that are invited as observers and as part of the mechanism called BRICS outreach uh, in Kazan in October. The top BRICS can explain to all of them, look, this is the stakes that we, we are all facing. Because the war on the other side is a war against all of us. It's a war against BRICS. It's a war against Eurasian integration. It's a war against BRICS. It's a war against the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's a war against the Eurasia Economic Union. It's a war against the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, corridors of uh, 
uh, trade and communication. It's a war against the international north-south transportation corridor, Russia, Iran, and India. So it's a war against Eurasia as a whole. And of course, the other BRICs will, I would not put Brazil into it because Brazil is now in such a pathetic uh, foreign policy condition. I prefer not even to talk about it. The, but, uh, the disappointment yes. of uh, Lula da Silva supporting new elections in Venezuela uh, is certainly uh, ring I, very loud I, I, in my head. <laughs> very loud in your head. I prefer not even to not even talk about that because sure. I, could, I could derail and go right. too hardcore. Right. That's not. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but people who read my telegrams and uh, the people that I quote from Brazil in my telegrams, they know exactly what I'm talking about. Right. Uh, well, I'll have a chance to see it by myself in um, November. I'm going to, for, uh, to the G20 in Rio in November. So uh, then I'll have um, the big local picture about all that. But basically, to all of you, uh, one information is enough. I'm sure you remember, we, we have discussed this uh, here in the past, the famous uh, visit by Jake Sullivan to Brazil uh, before Lula uh, was elected with a list. So Lula has to follow the list. If he doesn't, he's toast, and he knows it. Hmm. So this is very, very sad. This is very, very sad because there's no sovereignty involved. So Brazil is not a sovereign country at the moment. Unfortunately, it pains me deeply to acknowledge that, but, it, but these are the facts, right? Well... What can be presented to the BRICS as a whole and to the BRICS uh, guests in uh, October is could be something construed as a BRICS response to what Israel is doing against Iran and even against Palestine. And very important, all of you, guess who's going to be one of the guests of the BRICS summit in this outreach mode. Palestine. So Palestine will be in Kazan in October, sitting on the same table with all the BRICS and all the BRICS guests. So this tells you everything you need to know about who's supporting whom. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Uh, so Pepe, I wanted to also just maybe just briefly before we move on, um, you know, everything you were saying is so interesting to note because not only, I mean, we've seen it with Ukraine. We've seen Zelensky get the very cold shoulder from uh, this, in particular, this BRICS trio, uh, Russia, uh, Russia, of course, but China and Iran as well. But we're also seeing it, I believe, also with Israel, because as you're talking about all these developments, what came up in my mind was Netanyahu has not been to Beijing, has not been to Moscow. There has been no coordination. And in fact, what yes. you've heard actually from Israeli media and some of Israel's absolutely bat shit crazy um, <laughs> officials is they're not happy with neither with either Russia or China. So your your final words on this before we move on. Well, look, it's very important to remember that China and Israel do a lot of business. So, but at the moment, everything is on hold, especially after this slap in the in Chinese face, uh, the Hanye assassination. So I'm sure that the Chinese are reconsidering. Obviously, you won't read that in uh, Chinese media. This is this is ex this, these are decisions at the highest level, and they are strategic decisions, very very serious. But China is certainly reevaluating their business uh, relations with Israel. There's no question about that. And they are paying attention to their relations with the Arab world as a whole and to all the lands of Islam, which are much more important for China as um, we can say self-described leader of the global south. They consider themselves, China doesn't consider uh, itself a developed country. He considers itself a developing country, leader of the uh, one of the leaders of the global south. And obviously, uh, when you when you think about 1.8 at least a billion Muslims all over the world, China is looking at the lens of Islam as 
partners, as supporters, as diplomatic partners and supporters, and as at trade uh, partners as well. Very, very important. And of course, in terms of uh, solidifying the global presence of China as a first-rate diplomatic conciliatory uh, geopolitical player. So obviously in the, this uh, hurricane, let's put it this way, uh, that thing uh, swirling around inside the hurricane Israel, they are reconsid seriously reconsidering their, their relations with Israel. And Russia, like we said uh, a few minutes ago, it's much more complicated because of this one, one million plus Russian uh, Russophones, Russian speakers, uh, Russian passport holders, or double passport holders. And Russia simply cannot abandon them in the middle of um, genocide land. So uh, for, for both of these actors, the, the challenges are very different. Although the decisions, the strategic decisions at the highest level are taking in tandem, of course, but they have to look uh, around for you know the this um, variations, uh, this uh, you know uh, demultiplying problems. Uh, but uh, uh, we can expect from the Chinese a much more forceful position regarding the genocide and regarding Palestine because now they are directly implicated. Now they have their name in the signature with the Beijing Declaration. It's their responsibility, you know, so it's much more active. Until, uh, what, a month ago it was not like that. So this, this is a game changer in a sense. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next video.